welcome Vineyard Cincinnati family. Let's stand together. You guys look so festive. We're so glad that you're here. Let's worship together. We got a reason to celebrate. The King is here with us. He's worthy of praise. Let's sing this song together. I first do Nothing is better than 
Thank you that Lord when we 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 didn't have a hope in the future father you made a way for us we were lost in our sin headed for destruction father but you sent your son Jesus you sent your son Jesus to take our place and father we can stand here today and say thank you for your mercy thank you for your love and for your grace Lord we know that it's been a, a hard season a valley season but Lord we've seen your faithfulness and your goodness and your kindness and so Lord we look to you you're our king we worship you we'll put you first in our lives father and even as we're here this morning Lord we open our hearts and we say speak to us change us Lord we don't want to leave here the same way we came in Lord, we want to be touched by you Lord. 
So fill us up this morning, Father. We give you the glory and we worship you. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Merry Christmas, everyone. How are you feeling? You feeling good? Amazing. Well, we're so glad that you guys could be here this morning. Why don't you turn to someone and give them a high five, say hello, and, and we'll continue with the service in a bit. Well, hey, Vineyard family. It's good to be together this third weekend of December, and this is also the weekend that we get to start celebrating Christmas week together. So let's kick things off with a question that's asked all of us um, in Acts uh, 15, 11. It says this, uh, don't we believe that we are saved because the master Jesus amazingly and out of sheer generosity moved to save us? Uh, we love that idea of generosity, right? Uh, God was generous, gave us the very first Christmas gift in Jesus, and then Jesus gave his life for us. So giving and generosity, man, it all goes back like to the very beginning, right? That idea of generosity. And uh, we just kind of want to continue in that theme. So we're doing some really cool things uh, as the season uh, and the year closes out. We've got this initiative we've been talking about uh, in the realm of being generous to our, co our community. And uh, we're going to show you a video here. It's one you may have already seen, but I would just ask, uh, if you have already seen it, just watch it again with some fresh eyes and to see how God might be inviting you into this. Let's watch this video. The coronavirus pandemic is exposing inequalities in our community that are taking a toll on some of our neighbors, especially those who were already experiencing financial challenges before the crisis hit. Students who live at or near the poverty line oftentimes don't have access to technology that will keep them connected to their peers and teachers, resulting in lasting harm to a generation of children. The most powerful educational tool that we have is the internet. The most powerful educational tool we have is the connectivity that people can have one-on-one -on -one from all over the world, yet that's not available for each student. So at Princeton, we have 70% economically disadvantaged, and probably some others that are, but just are too proud. Uh, and I have to tell you that it, it keeps me up at night thinking about there are kids out there that not only struggle with some food need, but then also when they go home after school don't have that same opportunity that other students have, the opportunity to connect connect authentically with students from across the world, perhaps. Princeton City Schools are literally in our backyard. Now that we know the challenges facing them, we have to do something. It's just the right thing to do. So partner with us as we commit to giving 10% of all financial gifts given to us in the month of December to Princeton City Schools. In 2021, your donations will provide 500 Chromebooks and full internet access for the entire school district. When you go home, you're gonna have the same opportunity to get online, you have the same opportunity to pull out that device. We're going to ensure equity throughout and closing this digital divide, we're gonna be able to do that. So many people has worked so hard to get us Chromebooks and so much more and help us during this pandemic like we have been through so much this past year I'm glad that we can have computers and My friends should be happy. I'm very happy because it's helping me learn and I want to learn more and get more involved and help out as much as I can to help myself We couldn't be more excited for you guys to join us and participate in impacting the students of our community and the families of our community Please check out our website and find out more about what's going on, or you can text the number on the screen. God bless you. So, hey, that's pretty cool, huh? We're really pumped about the opportunity, like, to do something like that. Yeah. So just know, be encouraged, folks. Be encouraged. It's true. Every single financial gift given in the month of December uh, has, gives us a chance to do a couple of really cool things. Uh, one, we all get to have a say. We all get to have a say in how many students get helped, right? 
All depends on how we do in these next couple of weeks. And we all get to have a say in how much and what kind of ministry happens uh, in this church next year through our year-end giving. Uh, and the next two weeks are super, super important for that. Uh, and we can all we can all get there. You know, I'm a, uh, I love team sports. I was a basketball player in, in high school and college, and I just love the idea of team sports. So I kind of look at church and ministry as like the ultimate team sport, where everybody's contribution matters all of the time to everything that's going on, and in this case, what God's trying to do. So uh, we're gonna get there, we're gonna cross the finish line together, we can do this, and really make an impact on our community and on these students and on this church's ministry going forward at the same time. And if you've been around Vineyard at all, you probably already know this, that this is a generous group of people, and that this is a hopeful group of people, and that by God's grace, um, it's his story that will unfold uh, as his will determines. Uh, so we're gonna get to celebrate that, that stuff together. So uh, to finish your plan giving, whatever you plan for 2020 to, to give here uh, in the vineyard, um, the information's there on the screen, or if you're gonna be able to do a year-end uh, gift uh, and contribute to what we're trying to do at Princeton, uh, you can text your gift to the number that's on the screen. You can go to the website, as always, and give. Uh, and this is an interesting season uh, in our nation economically, and if stock giving is helpful to you for tax purposes, that's a way you can give as well. And if you're here in church today, you can drop your gift in one of the giving boxes at our information areas as you leave. So we're just grateful, and thank you for uh, all the generosity this year that has created these stories of life transformation and redemption that we are all a part of. So let's pray uh, over our offering together. So, uh, oh, Heavenly Father, uh, man, we're just so grateful for all of the stories of redemption and transformation, life change, all things that have happened through this church in the past year, and we really, really are seeking your plans, your purpose, headed into the next year, Father. We're just looking for uh, what you want to do. So uh, we just ask you put it on our hearts how you want us to be a part of that and how you want us to contribute into that uh, from a generous heart, and we trust you with everything that you're going to do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. everyone, I'm Adrian. Welcome to Vineyard Cincinnati Church, where we believe small things done with great love will change the world. If this is your first time joining us, text the word VINE to 97000. We'd love to get to know you. That's V-I-N-E to 97000. You can also discover all the great things happening at the Vineyard by visiting vineyardcincinnati.com program. Right now, we want to take just a few minutes to let you know what's going on right here at the Vineyard. For the first time in the history of the Vineyard, we're asking everyone to stay home the weekend after Christmas. That's right, worship in your jammies. Why? For the simple reason that our staff and volunteers are amazing, and we wanna value their faithful service during this season. And this will actually allow you to stay home and worship with your family together and engage in a special online service that we have prepared just for you. We'll also have something lined up for the kiddos so visit our website for complete details and have a Merry Christmas weekend together. In just a few days, we'll be celebrating the amazing gift of Jesus. Christmas at the Vineyard is perfect for the whole family. We'll gather in person and online to sing, hear the Christmas story, and everyone's favorite, Silent Night by Candlelight. If you are joining us at church, you must reserve a seat. To receive a text about Christmas at the Vineyard, text the word HOLIDAY to 97000. That's HOLIDAY to 97000. Or simply visit our website for complete details. Merry Christmas! For more details about anything you heard today, see vineyardcincinnati.com, stop by any info area, or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Great to see you guys, been your family. My name is Matt Massey, and I am wearing an ugly Christmas sweater. That was the challenge put out to you to wear an ugly Christmas sweater, and the communications team sent me this and dared me to wear it, and I have. So I've won and I've lost. And I promise you, it is a party favor in Jesus' mouth, not a cigar. So just, just so you know, in case you were wondering. It's great to see you guys here today. It was 1987. The summer after my junior year of college, that makes me old. 
I was not yet a follower of Christ. I was raised in a Christian home, but I went to college and became an agnostic, meaning I didn't know what I believed, then I became an atheist. Then I was back to an agnostic, and I was on a journey. I was trying to figure out what and why I believed. And I was on a very reasoned journey, an apologetic journey. And, and the, the apologetics mainly took the form of the resurrection of Jesus. And through some friends and family, I leaned into the resurrection of Jesus, and I began to believe it was true. But like many of us, even though it was here, it was not yet here. I wasn't ready to surrender my life. I still wanted to maintain the appearance of control. I still wanted to do my own thing in my own way. So being a good college student, summer after my junior year, I, I headed to Europe with my brother to party across Europe with my brother and a couple friends. And, and the goal was to hit every city and really bring the house down. And I was running from God. Well, you know you don't run from God very far. And as I was running from God, I told my brother, we were in Austria, I said, I wanna go to Greece. And he was not ready to go yet, so I got on a train headed for Greece. You go to the southern tip of Italy to the boot, catch a boat from Greece to a little area in, in Greece called Corfu, uh, uh, Greece, and it was the Pink Palace. It was known as the party place. I don't even know if it's still around anymore. It was a party place, and it was disgusting. And that's where I was headed. And I got on the train, I fell asleep in my car, and about five hours into the trip, I awake to lots of smelly, sweaty people and goats and chickens in the train as well as it began to fill up. And I asked the guy that worked in the train through a translator, I said, where are we? And he said, we're in Yugoslavia. I'd gotten on the wrong train. That's a rotten feeling. I was on a train in Yugoslavia, and this is Eastern Bloc Yugoslavia, so it's still, at the time, still communist. And again, it is filling up with smelly, sweaty people, goats and chickens, and I figured out through the translator that I could take the train to the end of the line to Yugoslavia and catch a boat over that way, but I was scared, I was alone, I was anxious, and I got pushed from my car into the hallway because my ticket didn't allow me to sit in one of the nice cars. So I'm sitting in the hallway for hours upon hours, and it's in the middle of the night, holding my backpack, wondering if, if I'm gonna get robbed or if a chicken or a goat is gonna get near me. It was just gross. And it's like 5.30 in the morning, and I'm crying out to God. I can't sleep, and I'm like, God, I know, I believe the resurrection's true, but I'm not ready to surrender my life, and I don't know why, and I don't know if you'd accept me. Would you love me? Would you take me? And in that moment, in, in that car, in that hallway, I said, God, I just want to see the light. I want to know that it's worth it. Is it worth it to follow you? Is it worth it? Are you the one worth worshiping? I just want to see the light. And we came out of a tunnel, 5.36 in the morning, and the sun was peeking over the mountains there in Yugoslavia. And a sunbeam fired right through the trees and hit me square in the eyes. And I looked down the train hallway and the sun was in no one else's eyes but mine. I had a moment with God. It was an existential moment rooted in reason and truth of the resurrection, and I began to weep tears of joy, and I gave my life to Jesus. What was that? What happened there? It was a few years later. A, friend, a couple of friends of mine, I was working for P&G, and like eight of us wanted to go to Florida for a spring break trip. Four men, four women, and we head down to Florida, and we get there, and one of the women we're, we were with, we were on the beach, and we were worshiping and singing, having good, clean Christian fun, and she said, you know, I'm just tired of feeling tired. I'm, I'm sad of how sad I feel all the time. See, she had been abused as a child. She had given her life to Christ, and her mom and dad had just died earlier that year. She said, I'm just tired of being tired. I'm sad of being sad. Would you guys pray that I would experience the joy of the Lord? Would you guys pray that I experience some, some laughter in my life? And we're like, yeah, sure, Absolutely. And we begin, to, we begin to pray for her. And I'll never forget, she stands up on the, on the beach and we're all behind her. She's arms are raised as one of the guys playing the guitar and we're worshiping. And she's like, God, I need you. I want to experience the joy of the Lord. I want to worship you. I, all that I have is yours. All that I am is yours. I want to experience joy in life. And then the unbelievable happened. A seagull flew over her head and pooped on her head and her shoulders. I kid you not. 
We sat there in stunned silence, like, do we laugh or do we, and, 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 what's she gonna think? And she turned around laughing hysterically, goes, that's God. That's God's sense of humor, I know it is. That's God's seagull. Okay. Till the, the rest of the days I knew her, she was full of joy, choosing joy. What happened there? What was that? And then several years later, 19. 96, my wedding day, almost 25 years ago, I was having a quiet time the morning of my wedding. I was reflecting on God's goodness. I was kind of having a personal worship time, just re remembering God's goodness and how he provides. And, and we're not promised a marriage. We're not promised kids. We're not promised, a, but I'm just reflecting on God's goodness and how lucky and joyful I was to have Kim in my life. And I was journaling about that, and then I got to the altar it was a long, stately church with a long runway in Nashville. And you know that moment where all the bridesmaids and the groomsmen are down and you're waiting for the doors to open. And I hadn't seen her. I can remember like it was yesterday, the doors open and I see this just amazing woman in all white with her dad at the end of the runway and it took my breath away. And my wife says that's her favorite part in the wedding to see the groom's chin begin to wrinkle. And just that moment where I'm looking at her, and in that moment, looking at her down that runway, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And he said, Matt, I'm giving you a picture of heaven, only you're the bride and I'm the groom. Only you are not dressed in white, you're broken and you're flawed, and I, as your perfect groom, run down the aisle to scoop you up. In spite of what you've done or where you've been, you are my beloved and I am yours. I love you. I begin to sob tears of joy. What was it? What happened in that moment? These are just three examples of what I call moments of worship that led to true joy. We have them all the time in our life if we would but stop and look and listen and lean. Worship that led to true joy. C.S. Lewis would call these inklings, these moments in time, or kairos moments, these moments in time, if we just stop and listen, God is trying to speak to us and say, I'm it, worship me. I'm worthy of your worship, worship me, and if you do so, you will get true joy. Do you want that kind of joy? Who wants some joy today? Man, we could use some joy. That's what we're talking about today. We're in the fourth week of our series, All I Want for Christmas Is. We've been looking at the four words of Advent, hope, peace, love, and joy. And these four words are the true words, are the true gifts of Christmas, culminating in the true one of Christmas, the one who gives real life Jesus. This is what it's all about. Today, we're looking at joy. And my key statement today is true worship leads to true Joy. If you get nothing else, true worship leads to true joy. We're going to talk about the day. Let me, let me pray for us real quick. Heavenly Father, we need true joy, and we only get true joy when we really, truly worship. Let us learn how to do that today. Amen. So God is joy. God doesn't just do joy. God is joy. God doesn't just do love. He is love. A lot of people think God acts joyfully or acts, no, no. He cannot not love and he cannot not act joyful. Therefore, if God is joyful, he desires us and wants to set us free to be joyful people. And when we worship him, we get his joy. It's only when we give worth to him that we get his joy. And that true joy, that unspeakable true joy, is what will propel us through life. It is our strength. It's one of our superpowers. Many of us, when we picture God, we think of an angry God. He's not. He cannot not do joy. Joy is all over Scripture. Just one of many places I'm going to look at today, just a couple of things. Hebrews 1.9, the author is writing all about Jesus. Jesus is it. He's more than anything. He says God has anointed Jesus with the oil of joy. That's Hebrew speak for saying God is, Jesus is covered in joy. He oozes joy. He flows through with joy. Again, many of us picture Jesus as, I don't know about you, but maybe you picture him as an angry guy. I grew up in a Christian home, but a very religious background. 
And Jesus and God were always angry, like he's ready with a lightning bolt, or he was a police officer ready to give me a ticket. Did anyone else feel that? Like, man, you're just ready, like, like, like he's just standing there, like, like tapping his toe, like, I'm, I love you because I have to, but I'm really disappointed in you. Anyone? Just me? I mean, just, that's, but that's not who Jesus is. He's open arms at all times. He's always got a smile on his face, even in our sin. Not because he likes our sin, because I like you. I want you to know me. First, First Timothy, twice, Paul says God is the blessed God. He calls God the blessed God. That Greek word blessed means he's the joyful, joyful, happy, happy God. He's always joyful. Paul commands us over and over again, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Why does he say that? Why do you say find joy in God, rejoice in God? Why? Because as Nehemiah 8.10 says, the joy, the, the joy of the Lord is our strength. God is joy. He doesn't just do joy, and he invites us into him to worship him, to give our, him our worth so that we experience joy, and that joy propels us through life. A.W. Tozer says, it's the privilege of Christians to be joyful. Here's what he says, Christians owe it to the world to be supernaturally joyful, and it is supernatural joy. We don't just work it up. It's a decision, but supernaturally joyful. In this day of universal apprehension, when men's and women's hearts are failing them for fear of those things that are coming upon the earth, we Christians are strategically placed to display a happiness that is not of this world and to, display, and to exhibit a tranquility that will be a little bit of heaven here on earth. That's an inkling. When we worship God, we get his joy and we choose his joy and then we bring joy to the world and the world could use a little bit of joy right now, couldn't it? It is said that children laugh roughly 300 to 400 times a day. But adults, it says, laugh only about 10 times a day. What happens? And it said 40-year-olds with teens laugh less than five, and I know why. There, you got one in. That was a good laugh. What is this true joy, and how does worship help us get it? New Testament is written in Greek, Old Testament is written in Hebrew. The Hebrew and Greek words are very similar definitions. Sometimes they have subtle differences. But, but they're very similar. The, the definition of, of joy in the Greek and Hebrew is a state of mind and an orientation of the heart. In other words, it's a state of being that we decide. It's a state of contentment, a state of confidence, and a state of hope due to past, present, and future promises. Due to past, present, future promises. It's the anticipation and expectation of something great or wonderful to come, but rooted in past promise, present seeing God work, and future promise. And it leads to a decided response, a choosing response. One of the Hebrew words for joy is sassen. It's where we get our English word sassy. Now I know that comes with an attitude, but literally, word, joy is like a sassy, like getting sassy a little bit with, with, with good attitude. So to sum it up, the definition of joy is this. It's a, a decision in the present that's rooted in past promises that have been fulfilled, rooted in present observation of God working and doing his thing, thus rooted in future hope and future promise because God always keeps his promises. We have a promise-keeping God. Our God always does what he says he's gonna do. He's always done, always is doing, and always will do. We have joy because of what he's done. We have joy because what he's doing and we have joy because what he will do. And this future hope we have, this future promise we have is not a hope like many of us think of hope. Like many of us think of hope, like I hope I get that job. I hope I marry that person. I, I hope I have kids. I hope I have that house. All great things. But those are not guaranteed. None of us are guaranteed easy things in life. None of us are good, guaranteed good things in life. What we are guaranteed, what we are guaranteed is love from the Father, and he proves his love by sending his son to live, die, and rise again. He proves his love by his resurrection. And because of that, he says you have a home awaiting you in heaven that will not disappoint. That's your future hope because of my past fulfillment of promises. Can I get an amen? Like this is what we have, this is what true joy is and what's rooted in it, it's rooted in future promise due to past behavior of a promise keeping God. Let me give you an illustration. Imagine 
you're a college student, and your mom and dad say to you, hey, we're gonna take you on an amazing, all-inclusive, all-expense-paid trip to Hawaii at Christmas. And, and they've, they've taken you on a ton of trips in your life. You've been on a bunch, every year they take you on a trip. You have a track record of them fulfilling amazing trips, and you start to get your hopes up, and you start to experience a little bit of joy now because of the trip that's coming, but then you think to yourself, will it happen? I mean, we are in COVID after all. Maybe we won't be able to get on the airplane. Maybe we'll get to the resort and we'll be on lockdown. We'll have to go to quarantine for 10, and we, maybe it won't happen this time. I know they've done all these others, but maybe it won't happen this time. And your parents say to you, haven't we always come through? Haven't we always done what we say we do? And you're like, yes, yes, you have. But this time, maybe it's different because of COVID. And your mom and dad say, hey, let me, let me just show you some proof of purchase. We bought some airline tickets. We got the airline tickets. You're like, okay, okay. But, but what, if we get, what if we get stopped at the airport and they don't let us on the airplane? Well, these airline tickets are our own private jet. We got a private jet. Okay, that's getting a little better. But what if when we get there, we're quarantined and locked down? Well, we bought our own all-inclusive resort. It's ours. Well, that just got good. So we're going, we're going. We always said we're gonna do or do. That's what we do. See, see, here's the deal. It, and then they look at you and they say something really miraculous. It's all been bought, all been purchased, all been paid for. It is finished. In the spiritual realm, the birth of Jesus was foretold a couple years before Jesus came. God sent his son to fulfill his promise. The death of Jesus was, was, was prophesied a couple thousand years before he came. And he came and he lived and he died. And when he hung on that cross to save us from our sin, save us when we could not save ourselves, he spread his arms wide and said, you've been bought, you've been purchased. It is finished. And then he gave proof of purchase by his resurrection. It's done. What I say I'll do, I'll do. You have joy now because of what I've done, and you have joy in the not yet because of what I've done and will do. I always keep my promises. This is the joy of Advent. This is the hope we have. And I keep hearing someone over here say hallelujah, but I hear anyone else say hallelujah. That's a hallelujah moment. Right, this is it. The story of the wise men is a story of joy. The story of the wise men is worshipers who found true joy and put their hope in the past actions of God, trusting in the future actions of God. It's an amazing story to think about the wise men. They're Gentile professors from Babylon. They lived nearly 800 miles away from Bethlehem. From, from Persia to Palestine, or current Iran to current Israel, it takes over a month on camel to get there. They left everything to follow a star. Just think about that, a star, a prophecy from a guy named Daniel that had been given a couple thousand years before. Can you imagine the conversations with their friends and family? Like we, we make this a little serene, easy, oh, the wise men came to see Jesus. This was brutal. They left everything to follow a star. Imagine telling their spouses, hey, we're leaving tomorrow. We're gonna be gone a little over two and a half months. We might die. We might not ever make it back. We're going to, to Bethlehem. It's a little one light stop in a small little backwater town in Judea. You know those Judeans, those Jews that we don't even, we've conquered them before. Remember those Jews? What, what, why are you going? The spouse said, what, why? To see a baby, a baby Jew, the slaves of Rome. That's pretty cool, isn't it? No, it's not cool. No, I, I, don't, I don't want you to go. Like we have, we, we have soccer tournaments. We have bills to pay. I can't afford you to have gone too much. Tell me why again you're going? Why well, I, I saw a star. A star, a star shining. This is not a serene moment. Oh, 
And one more thing. I'm giving a portion of our inheritance. Bob's giving some myrrh. Fred's giving some Frankenstein. Thank you. And I'm giving a little gold. You're giving gold, like, like myrrh, I can get gold? And they get up and they go, they risk everything. They risk their reputations, they risk their lives to follow a star. These were true seekers, these are true worshipers. What they got was true joy. And when they get to Israel, after a month and a half of traveling, they go right to see King Herod, the bad man. This is in the story where everyone goes, boo, Herod, boo. He was a vile, evil man. Interesting about Herod, he was a worshiper too. But he was a worshiper of self. He was a worshiper of his own small story, his own small legacy. And what he got was emptiness and loneliness and joylessness. He was called Herod the Great, but he's anything but great. He ruled over 40 years and he killed multiple people. Anyone that was suspicious, he killed his own wife. He killed his own mother-in-law. I could see that. I, he killed, that was a bad joke. He killed three of his sons just because they were suspicious. Emperor Augustus said this about Herod. It's safer to be Herod's pig than Herod's son. When he was 70 years old, he knew that death was near and he gave orders to collect all of Jerusalem's most distinguished and beloved citizens and they were arrested and thrown in prison. And he, they, he ordered that at his death, they all be killed as well. Here's what he wrote in his journal. I know that no one will mourn my death. Thus, I'm determined that some tears will be shed when I die. He was a sad, lonely, joyless worshiper. By the way, we're all worshiping something. It's not a matter of, matter of if we're worshiping. We are worshiping. It's a matter of what or who we worship and what or who you worship. What you give worth to determines whether you experience worth and joy in life. The wise men worshiped Jesus and they got joy. Verse nine of chapter two of Matthew. After they had heard the king, they went on their way and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. That alone is an amazing statement. It means the star had left a while. They lost the star and they kept going and then the star reappeared. When they saw the star again, they were overjoyed. The Greek word hey is translated into this Hebrew assassin. They got a little sassy. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary and they bowed down and worshiped. Imagine the scene. They leave Herod. They have six miles to go before they get to Bethlehem each mile anticipating, what are we gonna see when we get there? We've been traveling all this way and they get to the house and it's a house now. Joseph and Mary are no longer in the manger. The, the manger scene's a little over two years away. It's a baby book memory now. The, the shepherds have watched their flex, flocks some 700 nights since they saw the angels in the fields. Jesus is about two years old now. He's starting to speak. He's a toddler. It must have been a sight to behold. The, the, the town of Bethlehem must have been shocked to see these unexpected visitors. Bethlehem didn't get people like this. They come in, these wealthy professors, and walk in and imagine people in town begin to poke their heads out the windows like, what is this? And the door opens, a little baby toddler Jesus is standing there, googly talk. And what do they do? They worship. The word here for worship is they got prostrate. They put themselves in a physical. Can you imagine getting prostrate before a two-year-old? I mean, this two-year-old, he had done no miracle yet. He had done no profound teaching yet. He had not walked on water yet. He had not turned water into wine. He had done nothing yet. And they're on their faces worshiping. Why? Because they believe the truth of the prophecy that God did what he said he would do. He always does what he says he will do. And they believed when they read it that Jesus was the Messiah because they saw the star and they worshiped and what they got was true joy. And you know they never saw Jesus fulfill. They, 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 they probably died before Jesus lived, died, and rose again. And yet they still worshiped and they got joy. Do you want some joy today? then we gotta worship. 
And we worship not on false promises. We worship on the truth of what God has done, he is doing, and he will do. How do we worship in a way that we get true joy? Three things. I know I'm a alliteration geek, but three things to help you remember how to worship in a way that gets true joy. Confess, count, cheer. Confess, count, cheer. Confess means every day you get up and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord. You, every day you get up and you confess, I cannot do it on my own. Yes, we do confess our sin, but if you're already a Christ follower, you don't confess your sin to get God to forgive you. You're already forgiven. If you're already a Christ follower, you don't confess, confess to get his love. You already have his love. You confess that I need his love more today than I need yesterday. I need it, I need it, I need it. I need God. I confess my love. I confess my affection. I confess my need. We need to learn how to confess our need. Americans don't like to need anybody, especially us men. I've been married 25 years. It was early in my marriage. I looked at Kim and said, do you think that I need you? And she said, oh, honey, I know that you need me. You don't think you need anybody, though. And I've been on a journey to learn how to need, especially God. The first step to real joy is admitting my need, and I do that every day by confessing my need, and then I count. And counting is count your blessings. More than counting your blessings, though, we count the blessor. More than counting our gifts, we count the giver. We say, you are God. I want to seek your face more than seek your hand. And we look to God as God, and we say, you're God. I'm not. I need you. I count my blessings, and I look and remember all that you've done, and thus I believe and trust what you will do in my, my life. I have joy. It's in that kind of worship that then we stand up and we cheer. By the way, can I just say, worship is not an observation sport. I am not a demonstrative person. In worship, I choose to put myself in a demonstrative posture. I don't feel a lot when I raise my hands. I put myself in a posture because I know psychologically, physiologically, when you put yourself in a posture to say I need and a posture of surrender, something in your heart changes. When I get on my knees, I don't like to get on my knees because it feels awkward and I'm getting older and my knees hurt. But when I get on my knees, I say I can't do it on my own. You're God. Only you're God. And something begins to change in my heart. And when we do that, we give worth to the only one worthy of worth. We let go of everything else that we think we find worth in and we find worth in him. That's when we get joy. Do you want some joy today? I want to invite the band out. Psalm 16, verse 8, 9, and verse 11. The, the, King David writes about choosing joy in this way. Here's what he says. This is, this is confess, count, and cheer all in one. He says, I've set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. I confess, he's saying, I confess God's God, I'm not. And because of that, I know I won't be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad. I feel full of joy. My whole being rejoices. I choose to joy and cheer. And in your presence is the fullness of joy. In your presence is the fullness of joy. By the way, you want to get a yes in your prayers? You want God to answer yes to your prayers? Anyone want God to yes all the time? Then pray back God's word to him. When you pray back God's word to him, he has to say yes. He wrote it. Right? Come on, come on, right? Like, think about that. If you pray back, you promised, you promised in your presence I get fullness of joy. All right, God, I want joy. I want some joy today. You promised. I'm getting in your presence. I'm worshiping you. You promised me some joy. That doesn't always mean happy. Doesn't mean all your circumstances go better. You promised me some joy. I'm holding you to it. God loves it when we hold him to his promises. Would you stand? We are now going to confess, count, and cheer. We're going to confess. And I, I challenge you as we open this song, this first song, oh, come to the altar. Put yourself in a posture. If you want to get on your knees, if you want to come down to the altar, get on your knees, I don't care what you do. Put yourself in a posture that says, I cannot do it on my own. Some of you are here today and you are doing stuff you shouldn't do last night and you feel broken and I want you to know the Lord loves you. So I don't, I love you. Just say yes to me. Worship me. Give me worth. I accept you right where you are. I love you right where you are. You're my kid. I always accept my kid. I want to read this email that I got this week and then we're going to step into worship. A friend wrote me this. Two or three weeks ago at the end of the Saturday service, you got a word about someone with a broken heart. Shattered was actually the word you used. And that's the word I've used to describe my condition. You also said that if that's you, come to see you. But regrettably, 
I did not. I didn't seek prayer from the prayer team either. Since then, I've been pretty much in the same place emotionally, if not even worse. Well, after last week's message, my prayers became focused on what I've done to contribute to this painful state, and I leaned into the Lord. Led by the Spirit, I prayed. I prayed a prayer of confession and repentance with an appeal for grace and peace while I wait on Him to heal what's going on in my life and His timing. And in the midst of this time of meditating on the character and promises of God, an amazing thing happened. Something I've never experienced before, I began to feel hope and joy like never before. I was actually rejoicing in my suffering because I'd received the faith to believe that my anguish over my situation is firmly in God's hands and victory and healing is coming and he's promised me hope and joy. Do you want some joy today? Hold out your hands, would you? We're gonna worship. Just close your eyes. You don't have to if you don't want to, but I promise, I promise you, put yourself in a position of come, confess, count, confess, count, and cheer. And the promise of the scriptures, in my presence, you will feel joy, the Lord says. In God's presence, we will get joy. God, we're asking you for your for you to come through on your word. Your word says, in your presence, we get joy. We need some joy. We need some joy. We need some joy. Holy Spirit, pour out your joy. The oil of gladness of joy, pour it out. Pour it out. Let's worship. We're going to come do ministry time afterwards. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Let's continue to keep our eyes up.
So good, he's so good. Let's sing this together. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness to me. From the rising sun to the setting, same I will praise your name. Great is your faithfulness to me. It's so good. We serve a God who is faithful. It's God with us. Let's sing this together. God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant, faithful promises. Time and time again. What you say Though the storms may come And the winds may blow I may stand fast And let my heart learn When you speak a word It will come to pass Great is your faithfulness To me Great Yeah. 
Come on, church, let's sing that. Great is your faithfulness to me. From the rising sun to the setting sun, I will praise you. I will praise your name for every season. Great is your faithfulness to me. Thank you, Father. I'm going to invite the prayer teams down. The prayer teams down here and up in the prayer pit up there, or the prayer area up there. I invite you to come get prayer. Don't leave until you feel some joy, until you experience some joy. In your presence is the fullness of joy. Just call for it, ask for it, invite for it. Wherever stage you are, whatever you're going on, come get prayer and say, I want more joy. If you want to put your faith in Jesus, just turn to somebody and say, I want to know Jesus is my personal Lord and Savior. Do that. If you want to go deeper, whatever. God always likes giving more, especially joy and love. It's a true gift of Christmas. We're going to have uh, release you by wedding style, but please come down and get prayer. Hang out. Just do some just joyful business with God. Thanks for coming. We'll see you guys Christmas Eve services. Thanks for coming.